mechanistic to natural interpretation of the world. What I will try to do is obviously to um, look at um, what we understand as being um, you know, the, the building blocks of reality. So I'm going to be positing some quite profound um, philosophical questions, maybe. Um, let's see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our inherited scientific worldview deeply affects our ontological and epistemological understanding of the universe and our place within it. For centuries, Isaac Newton's idea of matter as consisting of solid, massy, movable particles reigned in combination with a strong view of laws of nature that were supposed to prescribe exactly on the basis of present physical situation what was going to happen in the future. Now Newton's mechanics seem to offer support for the metaphysical position of materialism, the view of solid matter as the bedrock of reality. Materialism claimed that all physical systems are nothing but collections of particles regulated by deterministic laws. In this clockwork universe, regulated by deterministic laws, God was still invoked as a final cause. Thus the concept of free will and agency was not put into question, but rather granted to all living systems. However, in the 19th century, the shift in mental <coughs> maps, bless you, from religious to secular ways of seeing the natural world meant the complex systems such as living organisms, societies and human beings could ultimately be explained as material components and their chemical interactions, thus eradicating any possibility of such facts as value, agency and meaning and consequently free will. Yet with the emergence of thermodynamics around 1850 and Einstein's theory of relativity in 1915, the concept of matter as the building block of reality proposed by Newton was replaced by notions of mass and energy. And in recent years, however, an alternative view has been proposed by developing theories in quantum information theory and biosemiotics. In the former, information replaces mass and energy as the fundamental reality of quantum universe. In the latter, information at the macro level is redefined as semiosis or as the active exchange of meaning among living organisms. In neither case is information understood merely as a mechanical process but rather as a different kind of natural ones. Well, in this paper I will firstly offer a brief discussion of the concept of syntactic information as understood in quantum information theory. And secondly, I will explore the concept of information from a biosemiotic perspective, where I will draw on theories of semiosis proposed by Charles Sanders Peirce in the 19th century in order to argue that, despite much understandable scepticism, the natural realm could be understood as being minded, thus involving agency, and as such could help in overcoming the distinction traditionally drawn between nature and culture. Now, as we have seen, uh, the basis of uh, Newtonian physics is the idea that nature is governed by laws which are perfect, infinitely precise, eternal, and are based on unchanging mathematical forms and relationships which transcend physical universe. In this view, the mathematical relationship represents the most basic aspect of existence, where the physical world is a subset of mathematical equations and information is a derived concept. Now today, uh, this concept has been challenged by emerging theories in quantum information and computation. In these, information is regarded as the primary entity from which physical reality is built. Yet this new concept doesn't merely represent a technical change in our worldview, but rather a radical shift in the way we understand physical reality and thus nature. Moreover, it posits a difficult question about the origin and nature of information as well as its content. A major issue that tends to confuse any analysis of the term information stems from the fact that there is an underlying ambiguity in the term itself. Information can refer to the sign or signal features themselves 
irrespective of any meaning or reference, or it could refer to what these signs or signals convey in terms of meaning. If we take it to refer to signs or signal features themselves, then we are likely to refer to this type of information syntactic. An example of syntactic information can be found in computer science, um, where information, or bit, is quantified and measured according to a statistical and mathematical model devised in the 1950s by Claude Shannon. It is important to point out, though, that Shannon's introduction of a statistical approach to the analysis of signals and their capacity to carry information excluded any reference to problems of defining content and significance, which means to semantics and reference. In other words, um, Shannon's formula can quantify the amount of information passed, but not its content and meaning. However, the troubling implication of seeing the concept of information in its syntactic quantity means that if time and space are a matter of information, then the universe, and thus nature, can ultimately be reduced to a computational machine where there is no meaning, purpose, agency, or value. Such a view, for instance, um, sorry, for instance, has been championed by Seth Lloyd, um, who offers um, the concepts of, uh, sorry, <laughs> Um, who offers the concept of quantum information science as the basis of an entire worldview, declaring that the universe as a <coughs> whole is a gigantic information processing system or quantum computer. Now he argues that it is the ongoing quantum computation of the universe that gives rise naturally to subsequent information processes revolutions such as life, brains, language and electronic computers and thus gives rise to a more complex system. Now, in order to understand why complexity arises in a computing universe, Lord explains that we should turn to quantum mechanics, so the branch of physical law concerned with the behavior of subatomic particles and their information processing ability, and the quantum concept of decoherence, so the mechanism by which quantum mechanics injects an element of chance in the operation of the universe. It is through this element of chance that the universe of all systems seem to have a degree of freedom. Now, this is a phrase that some scientists use to express the way things can change, in choosing a vast space of possibilities to create a physical response. It follows that the vast array of diversity we see in nature and in the cosmos is created by quantum processes, processing sorry, of informational qubits or quantum bits. Now, what this means is that nature processes um, quantum information whenever a physical system evolves. Yet, um, this view of the universe, blindly and mechanistically computing information, which is syntactic, has been challenged by many scientists, among them um, Stapp, Kaufman and Penrose, who have postulated the hypothesis that information processes are not mindless computational operations, but minded, thus involving agency and value. For example, Henry Stapp proposed it to understand mind and its observer status in a quantum context or within what he called a quantum ontology. And he argued that in order for information to be interpreted, there is necessarily the need of a mind or what he calls quantum brain. He argued that reality is built of psychophysical events which involve a semantic, and I would add a semiotic, understanding of uh, information where nature, and here I quote, actively chooses which of the possible potentialities or objective tendency for some events to happen could be actualized, end quote. So in this view, nature seems to be endowed with a kind of free will um, which stems from its capability of interpretation possible only through a source of consciousness which Stapp argues is intrinsic in information processes. Similarly, Kaufman and Penrose argue that consciousness may be related to quantum phenomena and that it is associated with a poised state between quantum coherent behavior and decoherence, as we've seen earlier, of quantum possibilities thus implying that information should not be understood as syntactic, but as semantic, 
i.e. as conveying a sort of meaning. Now, similarly to physics, the concept of information in biology presents a two-fold interpretation, one which is based on mechanically causal information or biochemical processes, and the other which is based on semiosis, interpretation and semiotic causality. Molecules and information um, have long been considered the major conceptual players in the core of scientific biology. Um, according to the biologist and the biosemiotician Jesper Hofmeier, both these concepts fail to fully specify what life processes are all about, namely semiosis, i.e. the sign processes by which living organisms must organize their internal and external relations. A sign is not the same thing as a piece of information. It is related to information but only becomes information through an act of interpretation. So, only when an interpretant is formed in a cell, in a tissue, and of course in a brain, does information acquire biological meaning. So in stating that life is based on semiosis, Hofmeier draws on the semiotic theory of Charles Sanders Peirce, who you could see a nice picture there, and his definition of signs. Now, Peirce's theory of signs is a theory of reasoning and cognition which asserts that all modes of thinking depend on the use of signs. Peirce argues that every thought is a sign and that every act of reasoning consists of the interpretation of signs. Science functions as mediators between the external world of objects and the internal world of ideas. It is important to emphasize that for Peirce, as for Gregory Bateson, thinking and ideas belong to all living organisms <coughs> and not only human minds. For Bateson, as much as for Peirce, a mental process is the activity involved in receiving and responding to information. And, since all living organisms respond to information, Bateson claims, and here I quote, that living world is a single intermeshing hierarchy of process relationship that are all mental in kind, comparable to thought. Now, we talked about thoughts as signs, but what is a sign? Well, Peirce offers many definitions of science, but the one I decided to choose because it seems to be the most uh, appropriate for this type of um, discussion is the following. A sign is anything which is related to a second thing, its object, in respect to a quality in such a way as to bring a third thing, its interpretant, into relation to the same object. Signs, according to this definition, are potentially always embodied, since there are always things, whether material, like a stone, or immaterial, let's say a unicorn, uh, which are not necessarily signs, but which can also become or act like a sign for some living embodied entity. And this sign relation is triadic, connecting the primary sign to its object through the production of an interpretant. Meaning, therefore, is a triadic relation between a sign an object and an interpretant. Biosemiotics, as noted before, sees information as a semiotic process whereby organisms actively engage with their environment, interpreting signs and therefore making meaningful distinctions. So contrary to traditional understanding, organisms are not passive elements in the hands of external forces, but active minded natural systems. Now, what I really refer here as uh, minded or mind is what uh, Hofmeier calls semiotic freedom, which is the capacity of the system, and it's a quote, a cell, organism, species, etc., to distinguish relevant sensible parameters in its surroundings or in its own interior states and use them to produce signification and meaning. What does it really mean? Let's give an example. Um, when a bacterial cell finds itself in a gradient of nutrients, for example, and swims right instead of left, the cell is actually making a choice. 
that the choice is based on a chemical reaction, of course, and not on a conscious choice. However, the fact that the cell favors a distinct response out of several possible behaviors means that it has the ability to interpret and construct its world, or a technical word for that in biosemiotic is umwelt. Now, this goes to show, as Noth pointed out, that any primitive biological organism interacts semiotically with its environment when it selects or avoids energetic materials in its environment for the purpose of its survival. First, however, goes so far as to see the presence of mind when he writes, and here I quote, the microscopist looks to see whether the motions of a little creature show any purpose. If so, there is mind there. Now it is worth pointing out here that for Perth, mind, thought and semiosis are basically synonyms and importantly he didn't believe in the dualism uh, between matter and mind since he believed that there is continuity between nature and mind and he called this principle cynicism. Also it is important to highlight the fact that the concept of mind is not narrowly identified with the concept of human mind but it should be understood as a natural process, as we have seen, involving semiosis. Now, by stating that there is correspondence between the human and the natural teleological thinking, i.e. purposeful thinking, I'm also suggesting uh, that there is, of course, a difference in the degree of such thinking. It's not the same thing, obviously. Um, for example, North states that human acts of cognition differ from other self-referential and self-correcting uh, processes by virtue of their greater degree of self-reference and self-correction. Humans achieve this superiority through the creation of symbolic signs which represent and control our habits and actions. <coughs> However, we share with the natural world both iconic and indexical signs. Now, or to put it differently, what is distinctive about human species is the capacity for the semiotic activity, that is, symbolic reference, so speech, not to be understood as language, and I'll explain that probably later on when you'll be asking me questions. However, we share the semiotic capacity as such, so the indexical and iconic, with all life forms. Now, when I talk about index, icon, and symbol, those are three types of um, signs that uh, PERS distinguishes. And um, they are quite important, but unfortunately, because of uh, time commitments, I couldn't put everything in. But you're more than welcome to ask me after a coffee break or whatever. Um, now, so biosemiotics does put us back into nature and in the same time reconstructs nature as a place for humans to belong. Moving on, on to my conclusion, will be soon over. Um, as we have seen, so new scientific discoveries uh, bring about new ways of understanding and describing the world we live in. If the enlightenment, in the enlightenment, sorry, the metaphor involved to describe the world was the working of clocks, and in the 19th century the steam engine replaced clockwork as the technological icon, with the universe being described as an entropy generating heat machine. Now today the computer is invoked as a metaphor to describe how the universe and nature work. However, as we have seen, this description is open to many challenges, solution of information, which seems to exclude the semantic aspect of information, and thus seems to carry on with the distinction between nature and culture. Biosemiotics but its concept of semiosis, as we have seen, as the active exchange of meaning among living organisms, tries to offer an alternative understanding of information. Seeing nature as fundamentally semiotic enables us to explore the hidden continuities between the natural realm and the cultural realm, and offers us the possibility to rediscover and redefine our place within nature. Thank you.